The movie begins with Solomon and a group of workers being instructed on harvesting sugarcane. While they work, a man observes them while comfortably perched atop the wagon where the workers are loading the harvest. During supper, Solomon saves some berries to use as ink to write a letter. Sadly, his idea fails because the berry juice is too thin, leaving him frustrated. As he is about to sleep in their crowded quarters later, one of the female workers forces herself on Solomon. After that, Solomon thinks about his time with his wife and kids. Years before he ended up in those cramped quarters, Solomon was a free man happily living in Saratoga, New York. He was a violinist, respected and adored by people in the city. One day, Solomon happily sees his family off. His wife is leaving to work as a cook and is taking their children with her. As he walks by the park later that day, Solomon gets introduced by his friend to two strangers named Mr. Brown and Hamilton. The two say they're planning to work for a traveling circus and want to hire him for his violin skills. The two men promise Solomon a large sum of money and that he'll be home when his family returns. So, Solomon agrees and heads to Washington with them. Solomon later joins Brown and Hamilton to celebrate the success of their job. When he receives his pay, Solomon points out that it's larger than what he was promised. However, the men insist because they say he did an excellent job. The three start drinking to celebrate and one of the men carefully watches Solomon as he finishes his drink. When Solomon wakes up the next day, he finds himself shackled in a jail cell. It turns out that Brown and Hamilton's true intention was to drug Solomon and sell him off. When his captors enter the cell, Solomon tries to explain that he's a free man. However, his captors have no plans of acknowledging his claims despite it being true. They simply say he's nothing more but a runaway worker from Georgia. His captors then give Solomon the most intense chiropractic adjustment of his life before leaving him to curl up in pain inside the cell. Eventually, Solomon is thrown into a pen with another man named Clemens and a young boy. He discusses the situation with Clemens, who is also educated just like him. Clemens seems to be an expert for their specific circumstance, so he briefs Solomon on what to do. Not long after that, a woman named Eliza and her daughter are brought to the pen, and she quickly hugs the young boy, who turns out to be her son. Although she already knows the tragedy waiting for her and her children, Eliza tries to stay strong for them. Some time later, Solomon and the rest of the captives are chained and transported to a boat while under the cover of darkness. They're led to the ship's hold, where they are treated like cargo and crammed with others who are in the same situation as them. Solomon comes across Robert, who suggests they should fight back and take control of the ship. They weigh their options carefully and decide to just be cautious instead. At night, a sailor enters the hold and wakes up Eliza so he can force himself on her. Robert tries to stop the man and ends up getting stabbed out of existence. In the morning, Solomon and Clemens are tasked with throwing Robert's body off the boat. Clemens says that Robert is better off in the afterlife. When they arrive at a dock later, Clemens hears his master calling his name and immediately answers his call. The man shows proof of his claims and demands that Clemens be routine to him. When that happens, Clemens scampers gratefully towards his master. He has clearly abandoned all signs of the intellect he previously showed Solomon. On top of that, he doesn't even bother to look back while Solomon calls out to him hoping to get some help. Shortly after, a trader named Freeman arrives to pick up his new workers. He calls each one of them by their name, and when it comes to Solomon, he calls him Platt. When asked why he didn't respond, Solomon says his name isn't Platt, and before he gets to finish explaining, Freeman slaps him in the face. He tells Solomon that his name will be Platt, and that he should never question him again. He then takes Solomon and the rest of the group to his office where they're clean to prepare them for display for his clients. A plantationist supreme named Ford later expresses interest in Solomon and Eliza. Realizing this, Eliza begs Ford to take her children with her too. Sadly, Freeman doesn't let that happen. He quickly sells her son to another client and declines Ford's offer to get Eliza's daughter as well. In the end, Ford only gets Solomon and Eliza. Distraught by their fate, Eliza has a meltdown, which disrupts the sale. Freeman immediately has her subdued and orders Solomon to play his fiddle to lighten the mood. When Ford returns to his plantation, he tells his men to give Solomon and Eliza food and rest before making them work the next day. Ford's wife learns about Eliza's circumstances and says that some food and a good night's sleep will help her forget about her children. The next day, Solomon and the new workers are introduced to a handler named Tibbetts and Ford's overseer, Chopin. As they work, Tibbetts mockingly sings a song that warns everyone not to flee. Some time later, Solomon and the workers encounter a group of native people and share a brief break with them. Solomon is then reminded of his violin after seeing one of the natives playing a stringed instrument. One day, Solomon pitches a clever plan to transport logs by the river to Ford. Despite Tibbetts opposing it, Ford is won over by Solomon's proposition and decides to go with his plan, and it succeeds. Although Solomon gains the praise and respect of Ford and is celebrated by the rest of the workers, he gains the ire of Tibbetts, who feels humiliated that his plans worked. As a reward for his excellent work, Ford also gifts Solomon a violin. One afternoon, Eliza laments the loss of her children by their quarters. Solomon is concerned that it might bring trouble, so he tries to put an end to it. However, due to her grief, it all ends in an argument. Eliza points out that Solomon knows Ford suspects he might be a freeman, but doesn't do anything about it. 
This statement unsettles Solomon and makes him doubt his stance on enduring Ford's good treatment. Ford's wife eventually orders the men to get rid of Eliza because she can't stand her crying noises. Meanwhile, Tibbet starts making Solomon's life difficult as revenge for humiliating him with the log transportation job. As the tension builds up between them, Tibbets ultimately decides to teach Solomon a lesson. However, to his surprise, Solomon fights back, grabs his whip, and gives him the most intense chiropractic adjustment of his life. Chopin arrives on the scene, and Tibbets flees after declaring he will have vengeance. Before leaving to call Ford, Chopin tells Solomon not to leave the plantation because he won't be able to protect him otherwise. Some time later, Tibbets returns with his buddies to lynch Solomon for the audacity to stand up against him. Chopin steps in to put a stop to it and threatens to shoot Tibbets if he persists in hanging Solomon temporarily forcing Tibbets and his crew to run away. Solomon looks to Chopin for help with his situation, but he just lets him be. Solomon hangs for his dear life, tiptoeing to avoid choking as best he can. The rest of the workers slowly emerge from their huts to go about their routines. They all turn a blind eye to Solomon's situation, except for one woman who stealthily brings water for Solomon to drink. After nearly a day of hanging for his dear life, Solomon is finally freed when Ford returns to the plantation. He drags Solomon inside the house to protect him. However, Ford realizes that his plantation is no longer safe for Solomon because Tibbets will never relinquish his right to retaliate for what happened. He tells Solomon that he'll sell him to a man named Epps. Although Epps is known to be a brutal man, Ford says he's the only one willing to accept Solomon due to the reputation he gained after fighting back against Tibbets. Solomon tries to explain that he's a free man, but Ford doesn't want to hear it because he's scared that such knowledge will only bring trouble for him. On the day Solomon arrives at Epps' plantation, he and the rest of the workers listen to him read a verse from the Bible. However, Epps skews the message of the holy book to support his claim of ownership over them. After a day of picking cotton, each worker on Epps' plantation is evaluated based on the weight of what they've harvested. Solomon's yield is below average, and he ends up getting chiropractic adjustments along with other men who had poor performance than their previous day of work. The most excellent worker on the plantation is a woman named Patsy. Epps seems to be fond of her and even lavishes her with praise. Epps later disturbs his workers sleep late at night to make them entertain them with some dancing. During that time, a jealous Mrs. Epps throws a large decanter at Patsy's head, knocking her down. She demands Epps to get rid of Patsy and even threatens to leave him if he doesn't. Much to her dismay, Epps says he'd rather lose her first than Patsy. After Patsy is dragged out of the room, Epps orders everyone to continue dancing so his mood won't be ruined. One afternoon, Mrs. Epps sends Solomon to shop for her. When she gives him a list, she notices him reading it. She then warns him that nothing good will come of it because they're only there to work. While on his way to the store, Solomon decides to try running away. However, he runs into a lynching and ends up having his spirit broken after witnessing the fate of the two men being lynched. As Solomon puts the items Mrs. Epps ordered him to buy in a bag, a bundle of paper catches his attention. Upon returning to the plantation, Mrs. Epps asks Solomon if he ran into any trouble, and he tells her no. One afternoon, Epps sends Solomon to fetch Patsy from the neighboring plantation owned by a man named Shaw. Patsy is there to visit Mrs. Shaw, who used to be a worker like her but was raised in status after marrying Mrs. Shaw. Epps is concerned that Shaw might make a move on Patsy and steal her from him. Although Solomon is in a hurry, Mrs. Shaw makes him take a break and join them for tea. When they return to Epps' plantation later, they see him intoxicated. Solomon quietly tells Patsy not to keep her head down and go to her quarters. Epps notices this and misunderstands Solomon. He becomes jealous and tries to subdue and teach him a lesson. However, Solomon avoids Epps while trying to talk him back to his senses. After a while of playing tag around the yard, Mrs. Epps steps in to voice her disapproval of Epps' obsession with Patsy. Then, later that night, Epps takes Patsy out of their quarters and forces himself on her. During their next late-night dance number inside the house, Mrs. Epps berates Patsy for her husband's adulterous ways. She even goes as far as to claw and wound Patsy's face. Tired of her circumstances, Patsy begs Solomon to end her life in exchange for a piece of jewelry. Much to her dismay, Solomon denies her ungodly request. One day, a plague hits Epps' cotton fields. He believes it's a plague sent by God because of his ungodly workers. As a result, he has no choice but to rent his workers to his acquaintance, Mr. Judge. Before he leaves, he tells all his workers not to bring any plagues to their new temporary employer. In the present, the day after Solomon gets taken advantage of by a fellow worker, he gets called by his current employer. It seems Judge knows of Solomon's musical talent and recommends him to another acquaintance looking for music for a party he's hosting. He promises that Solomon will get to keep his earnings from the job. Some time passes, and Solomon and the rest of the workers return to their plantation. A happy-looking ex condescendingly welcomes them back. As Solomon walks by Patsy, she gives him a bitter look with her injured eyes. Solomon and the rest of the workers resume work in the cotton fields. A man named Ansby joins them, but unlike the rest, he's a paid laborer trying to earn money to get back on his feet. By the end of the day, despite harvesting significantly less than everyone else, 
he doesn't get chiropractic adjustments like Solomon and the rest of the underperformers. Later that night, Onsby attends to Solomon's wounds and shares his tale. Since he seems like a kind man with sympathy, Solomon takes the risk of interesting him to send a letter to his friend in the north. In exchange for this favor, Solomon will give all the profits of his violin playing gig to him. Onsby swears his silence, and so Solomon hands him the money. He tells Solomon to get his letter ready in two days so he can mail it. Solomon writes his letter using a piece of paper he stole from the items Mrs. Epps usually sends him to procure. However, that evening, he's surprised that Epps knows his plans and realizes Onsby betrayed him. Fortunately, Solomon hasn't handed over his letter to Onsby yet. He uses his wit to turn things around by taking advantage of the fact that Onsby is a drunkard. Solomon successfully convinces Epps that everything is just Onsby's scheme so he can be hired as Epps' new overseer. When he burns the letter he made that night, Solomon sees his opportunity to attain freedom vanish before his eyes. Time passes, and Solomon is assigned to help a carpenter named Bass build a gazebo on the plantation. Bass is from the north, and his beliefs about the workers' treatment are the opposite of Epps's which makes Solomon notice him. One Sunday, Epps gets worked up after thinking that Patsy has fled after failing to find her. When Patsy returns later, she explains that she came from Shaw's plantation to get some soap because she wants to clean herself. Sadly, jealousy and rage have fully taken over Epps, and her explanation fell on deaf ears. Epps is inclined to finally give Patsy a chiropractic adjustment, and Mrs. Epps is there to urge him. However, it seems he doesn't have the guts to do it, so he orders Solomon to do it on his behalf. While Solomon holds back his strength at first, he is eventually made to go all out. Unsatisfied by what's happening, Epps finally takes over and mercilessly whips Batsy. Horrified by what's happening before him, Solomon melts down and tells Epps that he will eventually pay for his wicked deeds. Solomon one day finds himself alone with Bass, and he asks him where he's from. Bass says he's from Canada, and Solomon reveals all his knowledge about the place. Realizing he is no ordinary worker, Bass asks how Solomon ended up on the plantation. At first, Solomon is hesitant to tell him, but after trusting Bass and his reassurance, he shares it all. Bass believes his story and recognizes the injustice in the plantation. Eventually, Solomon decides to take the risk. He asks Bass to write his DM to inform his friends in Saratoga about his situation. Although he is facing immense risk himself, Bass agrees to help Solomon. Time passes on the plantation once again. Solomon is doing some farmville by the fields when a carriage arrives. The sheriff calls out for Platt, and Solomon answers the call. When Solomon approaches him, the sheriff points out a man by the carriage and asks if he recognizes him. After closer inspection, Solomon recognizes the man as Mr. Parker, a friend of his in Saratoga. After further prodding about his identity, the sheriff acknowledges Solomon's true identity. Solomon rushes to embrace his friend. On their way to the carriage, Epps steps in to try and stop Solomon from leaving. However, the sheriff intervenes, stating that Solomon is a freeman. As Solomon is about to ride the carriage, Patsy calls to him, and he gives her one final embrace before leaving. When Solomon finally sees his family in Saratoga, the first thing he does is apologize to them for his sorry state. His daughter embraces him and introduces him to his grandchild, who shares the same name as him. Surrounded by the embrace of his family, Solomon is in tears, finally free from the nightmare he has been living. Solomon tried to take legal action against the people who put him through his ordeals. Sadly, because of the lackluster laws they had access to at that time for his circumstances, it was unsuccessful. He also became active in the abolitionist movement, doing his best to help raise awareness about the inhumane problems they faced. The date, location, and circumstances of Solomon's death are unknown. Subscribe for more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like. It really helps the channel.